Doug, and this is Michelle. We're going to talk about tomatoes today. And what we're going to do is, first of all, we'll talk a little bit in general about tomatoes, uh, some of the products that we have that can help you in uh, having a successful tomato crop. And then after a while, what we'll do is we'll kind of open it up to you. We want to hear about what's happening with your tomatoes. We assume that you're probably growing tomatoes or you wouldn't be here because it is a little bit late to start them after all. So you probably have tomatoes somewhere along the line. And so we'll talk about some of the problems with tomatoes, but we'd like to hear successes too about what's going on uh, in your yard. So why don't we have the questions uh, at that point and Michelle will address specific questions. So as you probably know, in general, there are two kinds of tomatoes. Uh, there are determinate and indeterminate. Uh, the determinate tomatoes generally produce all of their fruit in one short period of time, maybe a couple weeks. And then that's the end of the season pretty much for them. So people use those a lot of times for canning or paste uh, because they get all the fruit all at once and then it's done. Uh, the indeterminate tomatoes, they produce all season long and they're vining tomatoes so they kind of stretch out a lot and they can uh, produce for you really all season. I think, I think last year I had some green and red uh, cherry tomatoes into just about November because the, the days were pretty mild, uh, nights hadn't really started to get too cold yet and so it was a pretty long crop even though it seems like it takes a little while for them to get started after all June is kind of the, the cruelest month for all of us gardeners and our plants, right? I mean, there's monsoon just kind of teasing us about whether it's really going to happen or not. So you have hot, dry air, dry wind, and plants are trying to get going. We water them a lot, but we can't really give them humidity. We need uh, Mother Nature to help us with that. And then you have the pests and the animals and so on. I, woke up one morning to notice that my tomato plant and the whole frame and everything, which I thought was like indestructible, had been knocked over by javelina, which took a bite out of one branch and just left it there. Didn't really want anything, and it just had to kind of stumble through and, and do the damage. Fortunately, I was able to kind of put everything back up, and the tomato plant has recovered. And it's doing pretty well. It's got some little green tomatoes. So um, another thing. Now about pruning tomatoes, uh, really if you're growing the determinate ones or even the patio tomatoes, which are also usually determinate style, you don't, you really shouldn't prune them, I mean unless something is broken or an animal is taking a bite or you see something that's diseased because the determinate ones are more like bushy tomatoes and they're not going to get that big. The indeterminates tend to grow a little bit longer and, and they're kind of like vines in a way, so you can you can prune them if you think maybe it's getting in the way here, but it's not really necessary. And a lot of times, uh, dense growth is a good thing to have because it can shelter the tomatoes that are trying to grow underneath, because after all, the sun can be a little bit rough on tomatoes, especially if you're not there, they're out there all day long, especially afternoon sun. So pruning is kind of an iffy thing, maybe not recommended, it kind of depends on your point of view. Watering is always a big question. People always come in and they'll say, how much should I water my tomatoes? Well, unfortunately there's no set answer for that. Uh, but a general rule of thumb is, uh, is that you want to make sure that the ground stays moist, but not soggy. It shouldn't be swampy or muddy. You don't want to let the plants dry out. And when you find that kind of sweet spot of keeping them moist, then you want to be consistent. You want them to do that all the time. Don't let them dry out and flood them and then water them every day thinking you're going to catch up for the fact that they dried out while you were away. Consistent, even watering is, uh, is very important. Um, with that, uh, if you are very consistent with your watering, you'll have less cracking. Um, cracking happens when you know, it does dry out and then you get a lot of water and, and the plant just goes, oh, and, and that's when you get those cracks in your tomato plants. Um, a lot of times we will get them during our monsoons, which you can't help. Um, just kind of use some common sense. If we get a big rainstorm, don't water. Just let it dry out a little bit and kind of help 
our season along and that'll keep your your tomatoes from cracking like that so we have a lot of products and practices that uh, we believe are, will be helpful to growing your tomatoes. And I'll just talk about some of these. Now, you probably already put your tomatoes in the ground, but um, this all-purpose plant food, 744, is good. It's kind of like the... Uh, just hold it up. Uh, this is the sort of meat and potatoes, you might say, for everything in your yard, and it will help your tomatoes as well. Uh, this is a fertilizer that you can do maybe three or four times a year and especially during monsoon season when the rains kind of wash this in it's really great um, if you um, with vegetables if you use the 744 when you plant it um, if you are just now starting to get flowers now it's a good time to do some side dressing um, because that'll help with your flower production as well um, Usually for vegetables, since they're, they're so needy, um, they take um, uh, so much nutrition. We're going to fertilize a little bit more than you normally would your shrubs and your trees and stuff. This. Good luck. <laughs> okay. This is kind of heavy. Now, this is humic acid. This is a product that helps the soil be more productive. It's not a fertilizer, but it can complement your fertilizer. It does really well. So with your tomato plants, you can use this as kind of a top dressing, and it'll wash in and will help uh, the soil be more productive because as Michelle said, once tomatoes start going, start growing, they really use up the nutrients. They kind of burn through the organic matter in your soil. So they can always use a little something extra. There's a question on that though. Uh, I bought some last week after the class, and the instructions say, you know, uh, like you're going to use a spreader or something for it, but like my front yard, I have rock with things in the rock, so it, I don't, you know, can you put it around the tree or? Sure. Yes. The question is about how, how to use this, uh, and the instructions talk about spreading it like a little whirly bird, but uh, also handfuls here and there. Oh will work all as well because after all with rock gardens uh, you know maybe an area is too, so much rock that you want to get to the soil that kind of thing but uh, I think you can use your judgment and, and place it here and there and what we're talking about with respect to the tomatoes is that you would just put it around the tomatoes it's kind of like a mulch sort of a top dressing and give them a little bit more to, to keep on going I just used a, a, about a half a cup around um, I have my my tomatoes in a pot um, and, and if you are growing tomatoes in a pot, the humic is probably <coughs> not something you need um, because your potting soil sh it is sustainable as far as as long as you're fertilizing it. Um, the humic would be in a, a raised bed or your garden plot is where you would use that. We also have gypsum, which you can add. Ideally, you add this maybe when you're putting plants in, right, Michelle? Yeah. But, uh, you know, it does help with uh, calcium deficiencies, which tomatoes can get. Also helps to break up the clay in the soil. So if, uh, if you're beyond the digging hole in the ground planting, you can also sprinkle this as a top dressing, and it'll help with the calcium deficiencies. And then um, when you first plant, this is what you should use uh, at the bottom of your hole. Um, that'll help get it. Um, this is the more efficient way to fertilize your tomatoes to keep that blossom end rot from happening. If you did not do this, it kind of leads into the next product that we're going to show you, which is the rot stop. Um, the rot stop is a liquid calcium. Um, so if you did not put this on, you could, can sprinkle it on and it'll continue to give it out. Um, but the, the rot stop is instant. So you spread it on the leaves, the flowers, and, and it just gets into the plant automatically. Yeah. So the liquid calcium that you can use, that Michelle just mentioned, the raw stop, this is something you can spray on your plants <laughs> and will help. Sometimes you'll see like a little brown spot on the bottom of your tomato. Yeah, there's that a can, picture right there. That, can be, uh, that may be a result of uh, a calcium deficiency or maybe overwatering the tomatoes. So the raw stop and this tomato and blossom scent 
you can spray these like every every two weeks, alternate them. And this helps tomatoes get going. A lot of people say, well, I've got all this green growth, I have no flowers. Well, this tomato blossom set helps to promote flowering. And as you know, we're not going to get tomatoes uh, until we get flowers. So these products can be used in conjunction with each other. They're both ready to use. You can just spritz them on the plants, and I think it should help a lot with their growth. Now, and the tomato blossom set also helps from uh, blossom drop. Um, unfortunately, here in Prescott, our higher temperatures um, can cause uh, blossoms to drop. Um, they don't like temperatures over 95, um, which we've been kind of teeter-tottering on. Um, so if you have a lot of that, um, you can spray that blossom set on. It, it promotes the blossom to stay where it is, and it gives it a little bit more energy to um, uh, pollinate, and so it stays on the plant. We have another great product called Flower Power, and this is uh, very high in potassium, and it can be Foster. used, uh, phosphorus, I'm sorry. <laughs> it can be used on your tomatoes, but also on all your deck plants, like all the annuals that you might have here. I, I, this is easy to use. You just scoop out and just scoop in there, two, uh, one scoop per gallon, and you can water your plants every couple weeks, and it will help them flower all through the season. So twice a week application of flower power it works. It works really well. That's flower, that stuff's <laughs> incredible. What's, what's really in there? I've used that for two seasons now. It, it is pretty amazing, yeah. I think it's just uh, it's a high high dose of phosphorus, basically. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, that's what plants need when it's hot and they're putting out a lot of flowers, and they uh, they basically you know need a lot of food because it takes a lot of energy, whether it's a tomato or a beautiful geranium, whatever it might be. So it, it's a, it's a great product. Um, and it's great for tomatoes, peppers, squash, anything that has those flowers. How often? It can be used every two, every two weeks. Yeah. So what I do is I just put a couple of scoops in my watering can, which happens to be two gallons, and the two gallons is about enough to water all my deck plants. So every couple of weeks, instead of like pulling out the hose or the watering can without anything, I just do that and give them uh, some flower power mixed in water. It kind of turns the water sort of blue, and uh, it really is uh, helps you get a lot more flowers. So now the last product I want to mention here is this multi-purpose insect spray. Of course, we don't want to hear about this, but uh, chances are they're going to be some kind of insect, whether it's aphids, mites, who knows what it might be. This is the spray that you can use, and it's also okay uh, the two, you know, on plants. It's not going to be toxic. Uh, you can, you know, later on in the season, you can eat those tomatoes. Michelle, do you want to add anything about this? Um. Or? This is probably our, it, it is called multi-purpose spray for a reason. Um, it can get rid of a lot of different things. It's a contact and a residual spray. So it gets on the plant. Um, so if anything is chewing, um, they'll taste it. They'll go away because it's, it, it leaves a bad residue. Um, the directions will say um, use every seven to 21 days um, for certain plants. So make sure um, before you use it, always read the directions um, so you know. Um, you can actually use this on most things up to date of harvest. So um, it's not organic, so to speak, but it's the safest thing you can get. Can you use it on uh, apple trees? His question was if you could use it on apple trees. Yeah, you can use it on okay. any, any plant, shrub tree, yeah. Does it only work for insects, or will it make stuff taste bad, bad for squirrels and chipmunks? Um, I don't know that it will work on animals. It, it is an insect spray. Um, basically, it's a synthetic um, version of, is this the, I always get it mixed up. Um, so there's pyrethrin and permethrin. Um, pyrethrin is a more organic um, crushed chrysanthemums. Um, the permethrin is a synthetic crush chrysanthemums. Can't talk. Um, but um, caterpillars, grasshoppers. Um, if you can spray this on your grasshoppers, it'll it'll. They might hop twice and then they're going to die. 
Um, so all purpose, aphids, thrips. In fact, it mentions that this will kill over a hundred different insects. And as Michelle pointed out, on the back of all these, uh, there are all the instructions. And when it's important that you read these and not just ask somebody like your neighbor, how much do you use, how do you mix it, and so on. This is your contract every time you get a spray of any kind and you get the information on the back. You may need a magnifying glass to read this, <laughs> but uh, it is the information that we're supposed to go by. So if you were spraying, for example, herbicide, and you happen to happen to spray into the neighbor's yard and damage their plant or their pet, you're liable, you're responsible. So you, any, any product needs to be used very responsibly and carefully, and that means read these directions. Yes, ma'am. How is it more uh, beneficial insects? Is it going to kill them as well? So the question is whether this will kill beneficial insects, and that's in ladybugs, perhaps, and, yes. uh, and it, it might, right? Basically, it's a contact. Uh, so is, is you want to use it early in the morning before you know your bees get active and stuff like that. Um, if they're not on the plant, um, it's not going to harm them if they go and do their pollination. Um, it's all about if they get hit with it. What's the name of that bug spray again? Water's multi-purpose spray. Just a, okay. Yes, so, sir. Going back to the earlier question I asked you before, um, Di Diana? Diatinaceous earth. Diatinaceous earth. I'm trying. about uh, diatomaceous earth, which is a, I don't know if it's silica, but it, it's a, uh, a, a grain, a very grainy product um, that usually affects crawly bugs. And that's a scientific term, I'll tell you. Um, so anything that crawls, it, basically it slices their, their underbellies up, um, and that's how they, it, it works. Um, like I said, this this is a really safe. It, it doesn't have the o, OMRI seal on it, but it. it I recommend this highly. Um, there are other, the diatomaceous earth works on most bugs, um, that, like your caterpillars, your snails, that type of thing. That that's more of what that is for. And then the the rod stop and. Blossom set. Are those organic? Well, there's no or basically organic. Um, to get the organic seal, you have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. Um, but the ingredients you, that are in you here. Spray that on, on an ice cream pop and lick it. <laughs> Probably not. You know, um, but. Okay. That's the only okay. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't put diatomaceous earth on an ice cream pot either. <laughs> so do we uh, want to open it up for questions or comments? Absolutely. Uh, tell us about your uh, tomato experience, or if you have any other questions about our products here or anything else. But we'll try and talk about what's happening with your uh, tomatoes. And uh, let's let somebody else have a turn, please. Um, in listening to the radio show, Kenny was talking about um, uh, the monsoon and using uh, fertilizer now before the rains hit. I use basically, I, I use flower power right now exclusively in the garden. Is, is that what he's considering fertilizer or should I 744? Uh, when uh, on the radio show, Ken is talking about fertilizing. Um, and July is the date, the uh, time to fertilize because you, and it's the 744. This is what he's talking about. Um, it's a granular product. 
Um, you put it on before the monsoons hit, and then we let the monsoons water it in deeply. Um, so now is a perfect time. Um, with the 744, we recommend three or four times a year, depending on what you're fertilizing. Um, your evergreen trees, you want four times a year. Um, all your deciduous plants, you're going to do three times a year. And your vegetables, I, I, I would do every two months. Sir, you had a question. Yes. Um, so this gentleman kindly brought us a sample. Um, this is, if your tomatoes are doing this, uh, this is just sunburn. Um, our sun has been so hot and we've been so dry and as far as humidity goes. Um, this is just sunburn. Your, your tomatoes will do this. Your peppers will do this. Um, if all your leaves are like this, I, I would definitely use some sort of sunscreen. Don't do it all around the plants because tomatoes do need six hours of sun a day or more. Um, but what I did is I took my tomato cages and just put a little shade cover on top. Um, so it just gets it during when the sun is straight up. Um, and then I, I haven't seen any leaves like this. Um, peppers will do this as well. Um, just June is just a really tough month. So once we get through June, well, tomorrow will be July. Um, but as soon as the monsoons hit, we'll be we'll be the clear. Thanks for this. Yes, ma'am. I have a basil plant in the house by the window, and the leaves keep drying. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. is it right in front of the window? So her, her question is about her basil plant indoors. Is that correct? Uh, I, isn't that really more of an outdoor plant? I mean, I, I, I know some people grow them indoors, but um, I think they need sunshine and humidity. And, and, and sometimes the window will have that reflective heat so they get hot. Um, so you might just put it in a more indirect spot or, you know, put it in a shady spot outside. Okay. What is neem oil? Uh, her question was, what is neem oil? Um, What's it used for? Uh, neem oil is in our product of home harvest. Um, it's a great product. Um, neem oil is an extract of, and I don't even remember what plant it is, um, but it is an organic product. Um, I don't like to use neem oil this time of year because it is an oil. Um, it burns. And it burns. Um, you know how we used to put baby oil on yeah. and get this beautiful <laughs> tan? That, that's what it does, and it'll just fry your plants. So I, don't, I really don't like to use it this time of year. Okay. But in cooler weather, it is a very effective bug kill. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about uh, other animals or birds being affected by that. Okay. So. On the fertilizer, do you just kind of spread it around, or do you have to dig it into the dirt? The, so the question is about the, the fertilizer, and uh, normally I don't think you need to dig, dig it in. I usually water it lightly because it's kind of a fluffy granular product and you don't want it blowing away and it's made up of a couple different ingredients. So I just kind of get started watering into the ground, but I don't think tilling is, is necessary really. So, yes ma'am. I'm um, talking about pruning tomatoes this book that I have on gardening it says that you should prune the like when there's a V in the branch and there's new growth coming into the um, the V part that if you snip those off but I noticed that a lot of tomato blossoms come right there so uh, is that right. something we should avoid just let it be um, so the question, I'm sorry, the, the question is about pruning plants, and there are probably as many opinions about that as there are types of tomatoes. But uh, like over at the Cooperative Extension, they say probably not necessary. If you must do it, go ahead. I think that what you're sorry. describing, <laughs> that trimming, that's really what we do with the roses down there when we're deadheading them. And I would certainly not prune any determinant or 
patio type tomatoes because they're, they're not going to get that big. So I think pruning is really a function of, of more of a necessity than worrying about where the little blossoms are. You know, if something's growing way out here and animals come by and taking a bite out of it, it doesn't look very healthy, just get rid of it. But as a, as a process that you go through, uh, I just think, uh, especially the indeterminate tomatoes that are going to grow like vines, just let them be. Unless, unless they look unhealthy, and you know, that would be the only reason. And I would think that that kind of pruning that was described in the article, uh, I, just, I just don't agree with it. But certainly my opinion is not the only one. I think it's a lot of extra work that you don't need to do in a garden, plenty of other things to do. And can you explain, I mean, when you're purchasing small plants or you're growing from seed on, on the tomatoes, how do you know if it's determinate or indeterminate? Well, the, okay, so the question is, how do you know when you're getting seeds or buying plants, tomato plants, how do you know if it's determined or indeterminate? And it should tell you should tell you on the label. So that's something to take a look at. So you look at, say you're considering an early girl, which is an indeterminate variety. It should tell you on there, basically. Right? So, so I do it. So the question is, uh, about a community garden where you have some tomatoes uh, flowering, others are not, uh, what do you do about that? And as Michelle was saying, you know, the temperatures get up in the, in the 90s, 95 and above. Tomatoes are not going to really do much flowering. It's, it's hotter than they would like it to be. But certainly flower power or the blossom set, those might both be products that you could use to give them a little boost and get them going. And, and so they can start producing flowers and then tomatoes after that. This is a so product. The blossom setting stuff is going to help them produce more flowers. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Either either one will do fine. Uh, but not both. How about over here? What varieties of tomatoes have you had successful? His question was um, the what what tomatoes do the best here? Um, I've heard a lot of good things about um, early girl. Better boys. Um, a lot of the heirlooms do really well. Um, pretty much, it, as long as you are tending to your tomatoes, um, consistently watering, um, all of them will do well. And a lot of it depends on you know where your garden is and what kind of climate you have. Because you know we have little microclimates everywhere. I've had great success with uh, Sweet 100s having a long, continuous season, and you just go out there and pick them, and they're just ready to throw in the salad, so it's great, and, and they just keep on going. I'll you know, pick five or ten of them, they're good for a day or two, by the time you go back out there, there's another batch, so, but I don't know, I mean, what's, uh, do you folks have uh, your favorite uh, varieties? The Romans, the baby Romans. Baby Romans are good? Uh -huh. Cherokee purples are really good. Uh -huh. They grow like crazy. Yeah. So, you know, we think of tomatoes as first they're green and they're red. Right, but they're yellow tomatoes, we've got purple tomatoes, and of course they're, they're red ones. So yesterday when we were talking about the class, we said, well, what are we gonna say about tomatoes right there? They're green, then they're red, then they taste good, and you put them in a salad, class dismissed. What else do we need to know? <laughs> but just like a lot of things, you know, it's, it's, it's more nuanced. And I, used to, I used to work in the printing business, and we said, okay, color printing, right? You got, you got blue sky, you got green grass, you got red tomatoes, what else do you need to know? But as we know, of course, life is a little more nuanced than that, and that's why we're here to kind of talk about the, the ins and outs. You know, tomato, growing tomatoes should be, uh, you know, a productive, happy experience, but along the way, things can happen. I notice nobody's asked any questions about the dreaded tomato hornworm, one of my favorite topics. Uh, because, you haven't had any. You haven't had any? Not once. Have you had uh, Yeah, they get to be really big. And, they, and you you probably see the results of their presence yeah. before you see them. Because yeah. they lead all the leaves. Oh, and they're so well camouflaged, they can just be right on the trunk, just hiding there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes at late in the day, late afternoon, is a good time to spot them. And one year, uh, when I had several tomatoes, and they were just being overwhelmed by these hornworms, right? And, you know, people tell me that if you have chickens, they love to eat them, so you could just pick them and toss them to the chickens. But I didn't have any chickens, and I got tired of trying to squish them. And one of them tried to sting me because they've got these little horns, you know, mm -hmm. their rear end. So what I do is I use really sharp clippers. 
and uh, I just cut them in half and just let them drop. It's not pretty, but you know they can just ooze green. Then I see all this green liquid and I'm thinking, there's my tomato plant. That's what it was trying to grow, and this fat bug came along and ate it. Now there's some people who say, but you know those eventually become beautiful moths. But after, you know at the expense of my tomato plants, you have to make your own judgment call, right? But this is not really to me a catch and release situation. <laughs> you release them, they'll eat someone else's plant, or they'll come back to you, or so. Anyway. her tomato um, to keep the quails out. Um, it, I mean, you'll definitely get plants in, I mean, if there's a way to make your fence a little bit bigger, um, your tomato would probably be happier. Um, if not, you, you know, they're, they're going to go more up, you know, they'll grow yeah, they, up. They, uh, they, they look okay and there's, yeah. there's enough flowers, but I can see that they're like straining at the so that might be a situation where a little bit of pruning would be in order, right? If they're growing like horizontally outside of the cage and you want them to kind of stay within the cage and be bushy and grow up, you could just kind of clip that branch and try to encourage growth within the protected area, you know? So I think that that, back to pruning, you know, it's kind of a utilitarian sort of thing. If it looks like it's going to help the plant, go ahead and do it, but it's certainly not something that we believe is a mandatory that's you know, kind of be essential to the growth of your plant. So, could those little worms be the ones that are putting in on my tomatoes? But it's only one of my tomato plants. It's not all of them. And they, they're, they're like bites, like somebody's picking at them. Uh -huh. Well, so the question, uh, well, I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, why are they only on one plant? I because I think they want to finish off that one plant and then put it on. Yeah. And it's something that's just picking at them, and it's just like one or two, sometimes at the bottom, sometimes at the top. And I thought it may be the birds, but it's on my patio up next to my house. You'd be some dogs. Oh, they'll come here. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, so, <laughs> I'm not sure if that is a result of the worms. The question is about the, the nature of uh, you, you say that there are little spots here and there, like on the leaves or you know, the tomatoes. It's big and there's maybe a, a nickel size. Bite. You'd be okay. surprised where birds can get. Um, I was sitting in, in my chair and I've got a moss rose right in front of my window. And there was a bird just sitting there pulling on it. It's like, okay, you need to go. It, it, they'll go no matter where. The bugs away, yes. Oh, I mean the worms. Yes. 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 Uh, BT is another product that works really well on caterpillars. Um, it's um, basically it's a caterpillar killer, um, and I, I'm not going to be able to pronounce it now um, what is actually in it, but it, it's a biological that'll kill um, caterpillars and that type of thing. Does the moth lay its eggs on the tomato plant? Is that how they get there? Or do they crawl on the ground? Uh, her question was, is how do the tomato worms get to the tomatoes? And they do crawl. Okay. They also lay eggs, because I've, I've removed them. Okay. I've got some pictures even Good from tonight. last year. Absolutely. So they lay them right on the plant? On the leaves, on the underside. Oh, okay. Typically. So it wouldn't help to put diatomaceous earth around. Because if they're laying them on the leaves, it wouldn't help have it on the ground. Well, that's when you dust them with the BT. <laughs> yeah. They're um, smarter than we are. Mm -hmm. I was actually here last week um, and I, I have four raised beds and one of them is tomatoes and tomatoes have been really nice and they've been growing in here for years. But I've got a flower garden and I have a gopher that's gotten in my raised beds. And I was here last week and I bought some poison. But dog that's lost its hunting instincts 
Um, and is there any, it's just devouring established plants. And is there anything organic or natural that you can recommend? Um, her question is, she's got a gopher in her raised bed. Um, gophers are tough um, because they, they have hundreds of tunnels um, that you probably can't even see. No. Um, so the best thing to do um, is to, um, outside of your garden, um, you can spread down the mole max. Um, that will, and then water it in. The mole max will get down into their tunnels and leave a nasty odor on it, and that way they don't go to that tunnel where your garden is. Um, it's a preventative. It doesn't hurt them. Is that the stuff I bought? Poison? Well, the, there's a poison that you actually, um, the way it works is you actually put it into their hole so and then they eat I it. To, yeah, right. Um, the good thing about, and I don't, we just got a new product in and I'm not completely familiar, it just came in this week, but um, um, the gold dye gopher bait was a product that just killed the gopher. If something else came and ate the gopher, it would not harm the next predator, um, which is why we were selling it. So what? I just need to check that product. I can get back with you on that. Mole Max. Um, it's a granular product that you create a barrier around things that you don't want to be. Yeah. We got it down at the store. Okay. Show you. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 there's a wand that you can use to get into the ground. But her question about <coughs> gophers is well taken because they are really tough. And there's no easy way to get rid of them. Uh, a lot of times it involves poison. Now, it's too bad that your dog lost it. So I think it's like, the, like the, a friend of mine's yeah, dog is still He's going at it. Yeah. Well, I have a friend who digs them out, shakes them around, kills them, and then drops them at the back door, of course. You know? so at least you know that they're being taken care of. It's just so you have to. Rather than just letting it die on the ground where you don't even see it, you have to clean up the mess on your back porch. But that's one less gopher in your okay. yard. And not all dogs or cats or whatever. Oh. And you know, those are mean little animals. I guess that's you know, worse. They, they feel trapped. They, they, can, uh, they, can, they can do some damage to an animal. And also, in the world of gophers and moles, there are all kinds of homegrown methods. And uh, some of them work and some of them don't. But I, a friend of mine has this contraption where he has a five-gallon bucket and like a computer fan. And he puts one of those road flares okay, in there, turns well, it on, you. turns on the fan, jams it in there, and just pumps that into the tunnel. And that helps before the gophers can really figure out what's going on. Because they're very sensitive to us moving around their areas. And they can block out Tunnel. If they think something's going on there, it's not safe, they just fill it up and they go somewhere else. They can just grow these incredible network of tunnels. I put, I actually put some cayenne this yesterday in there because I got this beautiful, beautiful ball. I didn't even know it was uh, around it, just hoping that, and I'm stepping on the tunnels. And, anyway, I'll, I'll try that. Yeah, so here's, here's the Mole Max. This is another product you can try. Um, and then the gophers could go after tomatoes also. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, they, you could get in my bed. They, uh, ate, they ate a whole bed of red potatoes that I had. They knew the day before I did that the potatoes were ripe. <laughs> and I came to harvest them and there weren't very few left. They had, there were a few little fragments here and there, but it is very frustrating and it's kind of an ongoing problem. So, yes, ma'am. Oh. Two things. Um, when I built, I built an actual cage for my garden. My garden is fully enclosed in a hardware cloth cage. But before we put it in place, we put hardware cloth on the ground. And because we have gophers in the backyard and they can't chew through hardware cloth. But, and then this stuff, it will work for chipmunks? Yeah. All okay. rodents. Momax will work on all. Kind of Does that come here. in a smaller bag by any chance? Um, I don't know if it does or not. Um, I don't think so. I think this is the only side we have. And you just put that on the ground? And Correct. Yeah, in the tunnel. So the question, in case you didn't hear that, is this woman was talking about abortion when she built the garden, installed it, it's protected by netting all around. It's not netting, it's the, hard, actual hardware well, like cloth. Metal. Yeah, metal. Right. We have metal uh, that you can put, put around a root ball that'll help. But, but you know, 
And to do this all around your yard is quite an undertaking. That was probably a fair amount of work to build your yard. Oh, yeah, it took months. And, uh, but sometimes, you know, that helps. If The problem is for most of us is we put in the yard, everything goes fine until the gophers come along, you know, and then right. it's kind of too late to rebuild it and put this netting, metal in there, whatever you decide. But uh, it's it's an ongoing challenge. Gophers are really a problem. Go ahead. Now, I've battled the gophers for quite a while, and my husband's redug out our garden and put in that hardware, the hard fencing. We've tried everything. And I'm trying, the latest thing I've tried, and it seems to be working, it ch it chased it out of my flower bed, is those solar things that you stick in the ground, and it makes, oh, they're sonic. They make a sonic sound. They look oh, like a sonic like that. that. Put stick them in the yeah. ground, and they make a and gophers don't like that irritating sound. Right. And so, so far, no good. So far, so good. That's great to hear that. So what she's talking about is these little sonar noise-producing gadgets that I think we've got some here that can kind of deter them. I'm you know, glad good to, to know. hear that yeah, they work. Absolutely. I, I've heard other people say, I haven't had much success yeah. with that. You know, maybe at first it drives them away, but with a lot of things, you know, animals get used to whatever you've rigged up for them. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you put those little glittery, things hanging down, at first it bothers them, after a while they figure out that's not a problem, you know, I mean, there's food over here after all. So a lot of these things, uh, you, you try many other things before you, you came upon the seminar, and uh, you know, it may work for you, it may not work for somebody else, so you just have to kind of work your way through the different uh, different ideas, approaches. Any other questions? No, but this is what I built. Any what more friends? Oh, nice. see it? Very nice. Yeah. Is, is this sunburn or is that, is that just, I got a lot of those little spots on the um, This leaf here. They're not the whole leaf, it's just a little spot. You look like you actually have a, a um, fungus going on. Um, Anytime when you have a spot that's here and it goes through on the other side, it, fungus will eat through tissue, um, and that's usually the sign of a fungus. It's almost made from the lower leaves. Mm -hmm. um, copper fungicide will take care of this, okay. um, and it is a, a, a good, safe product for okay. vegetables. Okay. And we have copper fungicide and ready to use containers so you can kind of spritz it and get local sound like you have to soak okay. the whole plant, reach down there. It's just on the lower leaves yeah. on all yeah. of my plants. Um, you can also, you know, if it's not too bad, you can pick the leaves off. I did. Um, but just spray the copper on the rest of it because okay. the leaves that already have the fungus are not going to change. The fungus is there. Yeah. Um, but it'll keep it from spreading to the other leaves. Okay. And these are. Uh, I have a pear tree that the whole tree has got those black spots on it. Um, and, and with with fruit trees, um, fungus, black spot is, is, is prevalent on fruit trees. Okay. Um, so the copper fungicide will work on that. Okay. Um, if you have a lot of sprays, it does come in a concentrate, so it makes it more econ economical to okay. use. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things about these samples, uh, the, is that people uh, people bring in samples every day, and we now have we've got a microscope that projects up onto a computer screen, and really it's a great projection. And a lot of times, you know, Michelle was able to identify these. A lot of times, you look at this, and maybe you don't even see what's going on there. Thrips, for example, are really difficult to see. With the projection, these bugs look cute and it helps in diagnosing. I mean, it may or may not be something that we can treat, but we encourage you to bring in a little cutting rather than a photograph or a phone call where we're just kind of speculating. We really need to look at what's going on. And a sample of a healthy part of the plant and unhealthy is, is really helpful. And then you go to the microscope. I mean, this is, this is what they do in diagnostic centers, is try and figure it out. You've got to have some help. And that's the help that we have now. It's, uh, really pretty neat. We've, you know, if you turn it on there and you, and you don't see anything, all of a sudden there's something moving around and you realize, okay, maybe maybe the spray or maybe copper fungicide would be in order to treat that. 
And if you do bring um, samples in, please put them in a plastic bag. Um, it keeps it from spreading to other things. So. Who gets the call for that you're saying for the um, it, It's a copper fungicide. Um, we have it in the, the store. Um, and it comes in a concentrate and a ready to use. I had one where I bought my own spatterings, all three. Um, he was saying that he has one that has all three. Um, we have two products that do all three. Um, it's the triple action, um, fertilone triple action, and then the, the home harvest, um, which both have neem oil in it. Um, and, and they do all three. Um, they're a fungicide, a miticide, and an insecticide. Um, like I was saying earlier, I, I, I kind of cringe on you doing it in the heat. Um, spring and fall, they're great. They work perfect. Um, and that way you can get rid of all of it. Um, but in the heat of the day, it, it's really hard to use. I got, I got one more. <laughs> My apple tree, I think these are cottle moss. <laughs> He's got an apple tree that's got holes in it. Um, this is a coddling moth. Um, coddling moths have two cycles. Um, originally, they come through when your tree is in bloom, um, lay their eggs in the flower blossom. Um, this is actually a hole from the critter coming out. Um, there are other spots where um, they come back after your fruit is formed, and then they they lay egg, some more eggs, and then they can go in. Um, so uh, it's really important in the springtime when, as your flowers are dropping, dormant oil, horticultural oil. It's all seasons, um, and we usually sell it in the springtime so we can take care of this problem. Um, I did use that, okay. and I've also got the color moth. Uh, traps trap, but I didn't start till late they were already okay going, so I think that's just started earlier um, usually you can put the coddling moss up in your tree right before it blooms okay. and, and you kind of keep an eye on that that's kind of your indicator where you yeah. know when you start seeing them that's when you need to start spraying one tree has none the other tree in the front has them all <laughs> so, well I got one two trees so. one out of two is bad no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want your class? Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. If you have any other questions, we're all here.